Um, so, uh, Terry Stone, absolute pleasure and honour to speak to you, sir. Um, lots of questions. We've got a few questions from fans as well. But to start right at the very beginning, um, before you even got into the film industry, you were involved in um, the promotion of raves and rave That's culture, correct. drum and bass. Yeah. Uh, yeah. But you left this in uh, sort of February 2003, is my understanding. What was the reason for leaving something which... I presume you made a healthy living out of. Yeah, I think I think when people started um, shooting everybody, I think that was when I realised <laughs> I should maybe have a change of career. But um, uh, yeah, no, it was the, you know when I got into the um, into the club scene in the early nineties, it was very uh, one love. You know, there was no trouble. It was a lovely vibe, and and I just think you know over the years the music changed, the drugs changed and the people changed. And I think um, towards the end of it, um, you know, it, 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 it was a little bit like the Wild West. And, uh, you know, I, I went from going to um, a rave that I was putting on, you know, with just a couple of mates and maybe, you know, a girlfriend at the time to having 10 guys attack dogs and bulletproof vests and stuff. And obviously that sort of took the fun out of it. Um, but I'd also built up this, these huge brands, Garage Nation and One Nation. And, um, you know, I, I got, I'd sort of got to the, the end of it. And I think when you're, uh, when you're in, uh, uh, I'm just trying to think when, when you're in this, uh, weird sort of thing where you're, um, you know, you, you, you sort of done something for so long, you've won all the awards, um, you've been around the world, you know, there's, there's nothing really left to achieve. And then when it become too much aggravation, um, at that point, um, it just got to, well, you know, I don't know. I just think you, you in all things, you know, if, 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 if you, if you can't go any further and it becomes either dangerous or too much aggravation, you, you know, most people said, I can't believe you, you just leaving the business and selling up like that. But I definitely sold at the top of the market. Um, so I think in in uh, in hindsight, I don't think um, I don't think there was anything um, that I would have changed. And um, I think you know I, I, I I'm, I'm I'm glad I sold it. Obviously, because if I hadn't have done, I wouldn't have got into um, uh, you know the um, film business. Um, you know, because obviously, you know, when I sold sold my two sort of brands, I I I, I got paid. Um, a decent amount of money and that allowed me to you know learn how to act um and you know get get a film funded and do various things so without that obviously it would have been a lot harder for me to you know become an so, actor so 2003 you left um rave culture behind you went into acting notice your first uh, credit of all things was uh, my family yeah. How did you actually make that transition? I mean, were you uh, 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 training as an actor? Uh, did you get an agent easily? Uh, how easy was it for you to get in? It's very difficult. I mean, you know, in life, all of the things that I've done have been somebody else's fault. <laughs> um, and, um, you know, the only reason I got into the rave scene was because all my friends kept saying to me, You've got to come to a rave, got to come to a rave, come to a rave, come to a rave. And I was like, I don't want to go to a rave. I don't want to dance around a field with people taking drugs. And yeah, it wasn't my thing. You know, I was boxing, I was running, you know, I was, you know, that was my sort of life. So to go into a field with a lot of people out of the reds on, on ecstasy wasn't really my idea of fun. Um, but then I ended up being talked into going to one. Um, and I think if, but back then, you know, if you went out, it was like sticky carpets, um, you know, there was a sort of start, a slow dance session where they played Luther Vandross songs and you asked the girls to dance. And um, then at the end of the night, it, you know, it'd wrap up at two and you'd end up having a kebab um, fight. And, and if you were lucky, you might end up with the girl you dance with take it, taking her home. So, you know, that was a big night, you know. Yeah. Um, and then obviously well, there was lots of fights and stuff because everyone was drunk. But when I went to a rave, it was like everybody was friendly. You know, there was no trouble. You know, and you had, you know, all these like loads and loads of women. It was just like, it was weird. It was like going into a nightclub and you really had to work to get get a girl's attention and to sort of buy a drink or have a dance for or get to know her or whatever. Because there was no dating apps then. So, you know, you had to work for it if you wanted to take a girl out. 
But then when I went to a, a rave, you know, there'd be all these girls coming up to me going, oh, you know, how are you? Oh, you know, let's go and have a dance noise. And you'd be like, they're chatting me up. But obviously at the time I didn't realise they were all out of their heads. So. <laughs> um, but, um, but, you know, that's really what sort of dragged me into the, into the club scene. And without those people constantly nagging me to go out, I never got into it. And when I sold my business, um, I didn't know what I was going to do. You know, I'd met um, the love of my life, who is now my wife um, and the mother to my children. And she, she was sort of like, you know, you know, I'm glad you get, you've got out of it. You've definitely got out of it at the right time. It's getting too dangerous. Um, yeah, what are you going to do? Property, you know, are you going to invest in things? Are you going to, you know, do something new? And, you know, I was sort of like, well, you know, I've always, I think when I was 16, I wrote a list of things that I wanted to achieve or do. And one of them was to have a bar and restaurant. So um, I opened a bar and restaurant with some friends. Um, and that was obviously the, the, you know, I was going to become this restaurateur or, you know, pub king or whatever. Because um, I thought, you know, it's entertainment. It's just getting people into a, a venue and, you know, the, the rest of it would be history sort of thing. Um, but I think what happened was... Um, I did it for a couple of months and then just out of the blue, I got a phone call um, from somebody saying, I'm making a film. Do you want to be in it? And I was like, yeah, why not be a laugh? Now, bear in mind, I've grown up on movies, um, EastEnders, The Bill, you know, um, all of the, you know, I think pretty much everybody, even, you know, I'm 51 years of age now. But when I sort of was growing up, it was um, the birth of computer games and it was movies, you know, and, and um, soaps. That really was the entertainment. So I, I was sort of grown up on, and brought up on that, but I never had aspirations to be a film producer or an actor. It never even crossed my mind. And then when this guy sort of randomly phoned me up and said, do you want to be in a movie? I was like, well, yeah, why not? Um, did the movie, met um, some people that had just come off Snatch, um, Andy Beckwith, Scott Welsh, who was a, a heavyweight boxing champion, and um, a whole host of other people from uh, Coronation Street, the Bill EastEnders, People that, you know, to me were like massively famous because I've been watching them on TV for years and uh, they were all very accommodating, all very nice. And they was all like, you know, you've done done a good job in this. You should maybe, you know, think about being an actor. And I was like, well, when I'll do that. And it was like, you've already done it. <laughs> you know, you haven't done any training. You haven't been at RADA, but you've come on the set and you've got a show now. So all you need to do is get some pictures and then send them out and, you know, you get an agent. So I was like, is it that easy? And they were like, yeah. So... I, I wrote a letter to, I think there's 300 agents, believe it or not, in this country. Um, and I wrote them all a letter. That's how I sort of, uh, you know, when I do something, I don't do it, you know, as a joke. I went full, in, full into it. I was trying to write all these people a letter. I'm going to send them some pictures. I'm going to say, I want a show I want representation. I'm a new actor, blah, blah, blah. And I actually had a few phone calls saying, oh, you know, we'd like to come and meet you. Um, I went to see a few. Um, and then I had three offers to, for people to represent me. And... Um, one of them was, um, you know, it wasn't like the biggest agent in in in, in England, but it was a um, well-respected agency that had some big actors on it. So I thought, you know what, I'm going to go with them. And um, as luck would have it, probably about a week after that, they rung up and said, oh, you know, my family have been on. Do you want to, you know, be in my family? I was like, yeah, why not? You know, I met Robert Lindsay and Zay Wanamaker and all these great um, people, and we had a real laugh. And then I got an audition for EastEnders. And did that. This film by then still hadn't come out. Um, and then I realised, you know, I had to actually learn how to act. It wasn't just a case of winging it. So um, I signed up at the Actors Centre and did, you know, four or five classes a day studying different things. And, and I met this guy who was an American and uh, he was um, he was doing... Uh, I met two guys, actually. One of them was about the method and the other one was about a thing called the Meisner technique. And he actually studied under Sanford Meisner. So um, I thought, you know what, I'm going to try this. And and because and, I read all the books, I'd probably had 20 books on acting. And I thought they were too, um, too academic. So, you know, you had to think about this and think about that and put yourself here and put yourself there. And, and I think when, you, when you're doing it, you know, there's too many things to think about. So what I liked about the Meisner technique was it was all about put your focus on the other person and then reacting to what they did. And the method was about, you know, believing, you know, what, what you're doing. So everything's real. So I kind of left, I did it for, for, for two years. Um, 
and I, I did a little bit of theatre, and I, I was just doing odd jobs as an actor. You know, I wasn't really setting the world on fire. Um, and I remember being at the actor centre and sitting with some people having a cup of tea after one of the classes. And as you do, you talk, you know, oh, you know, who's your agent? You know, have you had any auditions lately? And, you know, what work have you been doing? And blah, blah, blah. And a lot of them haven't worked for like two or three years. And, and obviously I'm moaning that, you know, I'm not doing that much work. And I've done more work than they've done. In, you know, they, they probably think that I'm living the dream. But for them, you know, I sort of said, ah, you know, if you, if you haven't worked for two years, how do you actually live? And they was like, well, we, we was eight of us sleeping in a, in a flat. We all split the rent and, you know, we do anything. We, we do cleaning jobs. We work in bars. We work in restaurants. We just do anything we can for money. And I was just like, fucking hell, this isn't, um, you know, I've, I've made a real you know, mistake trying to do this career because obviously I've got a wife and a child and I've got a mortgage. And uh, yeah. I was thinking, I can't really say to her, babe, you know, we're going to move into London now and we're all going to share a flat with some other people. <laughs> Yeah. Well, I want to wait for my acting career to take off. And, um, um, you know, I was a little bit down in the dumps, really. And, I've, and, and when I did the research, I think it's something like 95% of all actors are unemployed. So um, I really was thinking I've made it such a mistake here. You know, I've gone from running all these clubs around the world and being the biggest club promoter in the world to b becoming a job in actor. And, you know, I'm doing, you know, two or three jobs a year and I'm earning probably eight grand a year, which, you know, eight grand a year, to some people is is you know a good living but uh, you know eight grand a year when you've got two mouths to feed and a mortgage to pay and a life to live and obviously every time you get a call for an audition you've got to get on a train or you've got to drive yeah. into london park you know so you, you know you, you know i had money but i just thought you know this isn't going to last forever you know this is you know more like a hobby so so i was gonna say so talking about the auditions then um I've got that 2007 was the first Foot Soldier film. So how, how did that come about? How, tell me about the audition for that. Well, I was, well, I was just going to say, what, what actually happened was, um, you know, I was in this kind of funny place where I just thought, I'm going to give up acting and uh, I'm going to find a proper job and I'm going to do something else. And then I was with a friend of mine and I can't even remember where we were, but we was out somewhere. And, and he was like, oh, you know, how's the acting going? I mean, everybody thought I'd gone mad in the, in the club business because when you say I'm selling this and I'm going to become an actor, you can see them all looking at me going like, are you, are you sure? Um, so um, I, um, I sort of left. Um, uh, when, when we was talking, I was, I was sort of saying, you know, I think I'm going to knock it on the head. And he said, what do, what do you want to do? And I said, look, I really want to do movies, right? I don't want to do um, an episode of My Family or you know, do a little bit of theatre work. I actually want to be in films. And he said, well, why don't you make a film? You've been organising all these events and doing all these raves. You know, how does it to make a film? And I said, well, <clears throat> you know, you're, you're probably right. And thinking on my feet, I just said to him, I said, look, I said, if I put 10 grand in, would you put 10 grand in? And he went, yeah. So what I did was I got home and I rang all my mates and just said, look, I'm going to make a film, be a laugh. We're going to put 10 grand in. So what we did was we crowdfunded <laughs> a film um, and, and it was called One Man and His Dog. And that was the first film that I produced. Um, I didn't know what I was doing. Um, it wasn't a particularly great film, but um, it was a film. And what it did, it was a catalyst for getting me into the business because people saw that film and then started approaching me. said, oh, you know, I've got a script. I've got a book. You know, do you want to look at my film? Um, and um, it was a little bit like going to film school, but instead of reading books and um, you know, pretending to make a film, we actually did it for real. And obviously, um, you make mistakes. You know, things don't work out. And 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 I think that's always the best way to learn because <clears throat> in life, you know, anyone can teach and anybody can read a book. But actually, doing it is where you sort of learn and you you get you get the you know how not to do things and how to do things. And and uh, after that, I got contacted by a friend of mine who, uh, again, you know, once you get people start going oh he's making films now he's doing this he's doing that then you get opportunities come along and a friend of mine ran me up and said have you seen boys in the hood new jack city and i said absolutely i've you know grown up on them um and they said well why don't we do a british version so because of the music that i used to promote obviously i was connected to all the top urban artists and all the up and coming urban artists so we developed a film called rolling with the nines which was going to be made a slightly bigger budget, but it was still a low budget. 
Um, and we got people like Dizzy Rascal to appear in it. Estelle, Kano, you know, big names from, from, from that sort of urban music scene. And um, that film got BAFTA nominated. It won Rain Dance. But again, it was like another step up. So if you looked at those two films, you'd have gone, that's definitely his first film. He's obviously learned. And now he's done, you know, this one. This is really good. So um, that opened the doors. I'd, I'd also, when we was making Rolling With The Nines, bought a book called Muscle, which was written by Carlton Leach. And uh, Carlton Leach was, um, you know, his book was was the foundation for Rise of the Foot Soldier. And what actually happened was um, uh, we um, and developed the book into a script called Rise of the Foot Soldier, um, and for two years, just went around knocking on people's doors, asking for funding. Nobody was interested. You know, we, we had Craig Fairbrass um, attached as a Pat Tate because um, he looked, you know, a little bit like him. And we just thought we need a big guy who's got an edge to him. Um, and uh, people just used to say, you know, um, you know, the film's not going to work. You've got a bloke from EastEnders in it. There's no actors in it, you know, you need to get some proper stars in it, blah, blah, blah. So overall, God, it was just like, no, no, no. And then one day, just bumped into some guys who were mad West Ham fans. Um, they loved the script. <clears throat> and they sort of said, well, we're fund the shortfall on it, which was about a million. Um, and I remember leaving the meeting thinking, this ain't going to happen, this is bullshit. You know, because when, when someone says they're going to give you a million pounds, you, you always sort of like look at them and you think, well, just like that, you just give me a million pounds. Um, but I did do it and we did make the film. So um, again, <clears throat> if I hadn't done that step where I did that first movie and I hadn't gone on and done another movie, then I would, and, and if I hadn't gone knocking on all them doors and being persistent with Foot Soldier, that would have never have happened. So, you know, it just shows that, you know, you have to, if you do anything in the film business, you've always got to be patient and look at, you know, it might not happen in six months, yeah. it might not happen in six years, but, it will happen. You just have to be patient. So the, the foot soldier films have really taken off. And um, I uh, spoke to uh, Craig about the last film, Origins, um, and yeah. something I, uh, I asked him because of his background, where he grew up. And I, I ask you is that um, these films are quite violent. They've got increasingly more violent and brutal as they've gone on. Uh, from your own background, in that scenario, could you handle yourself? Um, absolutely. But I mean, to be honest, you know, when I was doing the, the clubs, you know, we, what you got to bear in mind, when I was going into London, um, I was um, I was like a 20 year old kid going into London, putting on big roads for 5000 people. So obviously I was I was pretty ballsy back then. And, um, you know, I, I, I really just, did, you know, I had nothing to lose. because I lived on the council, so I had no money. Uh, and obviously, if you've got nothing to lose, it does make you, you know, quite dangerous. But um, my idea of, you know, going around having fights with people or, you know, telling people how hard I am, I've got zero interest in that. I, I, I'm not interested, you know, I, I wouldn't want to have a fight with anybody. But if if it come about and I had to do it, then I would do it, you know what I mean? But um, I think when you turn 30, you know, you calm down and you realise that, you know, fighting it's just a stupid, you know, there's, there's no payoff. You know, you hit somebody and, you know, they fall fall wrong and you can end up in jail, you know, or, you know, they could hit you and you could fall wrong and you can end up in a wheelchair or dead. So, you know, I think, you know, fighting is it is a mugs game. So I, I avoid it at all costs. But if, if I had to do it, um, make no mistake, I would be able to do it. And I'm quite good at it. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not going to test you on that one, Terry. I'm not going to test you on that. Right. Well, um, we had a few fan questions uh, sent in to us. Now, um, yeah, there's some interesting questions here. I'll ask you the first one. Please don't take any offence. This no, is from fine. a fan. This is from I've a heard fan. Them all. I've heard them all. So you know. So. <laughs> <laughs> well, you may well have heard this one then. Um, and this is the most popular question that we had uh, sent in to us. So the question is, um, what is going on with that wig that you're wearing in the films? Well, does it make you laugh, right? If people always say to me, oh, why do you wear the wig? Oh, it looks silly. You look like a cross between Boris Johnson and Donald Trump, yeah? <laughs> and there's another guy, that Fabrigan, or whatever his name is, Michael Fabrigan, yeah? So That's it, I'm yeah. not a high those three people. But um, 
I think I think the reality is if you if people actually bothered to Google Tony Tucker Essex boys, they would have seen how bad his hair was, and um, you know it, it, people used to call him Wiggy. That was his name, you know, mm-hmm. and uh, I think people were absolutely terrified to say to him, you know, Tony, I think you should get your hair cut or I think you should change your hair. Um, yeah. He probably taking it very well. Um, but, you know, if you look at the pictures of um, this character, um, you know, he, he had the worst hair probably in gangland history. So, um, you know, and I'm sure they could have made the wig slightly better in some of the films. But, you know, I think the wig is what makes the character. And, <clears throat> you know, um, everybody, you know, comes up to me and says, you know, about the wig, the wig, the wig. But I suppose, you know, if it, if it makes people happy, and it entertains them, then, you know, I'll wear it a bit. I'll, you know, I should get one, shouldn't I? I should wear it more often. <laughs> oh, no, don't, don't get one as bad as that I one. Go. I could do a wig, one-man wig show talking about my wig. <laughs> <laughs> so the other um, question that, uh, and this one quite surprised me, uh, certainly a lot of guys with um, an interest in specialist interest films, should we say. Mm-hmm. Um, but the guy, quite a few guys have asked, um, You've got a lot of porn stars uh, in supporting parts, or several porn stars in the supporting oh. roles in some of the Foot Soldier films, and I think One Man and His Dog as well. It, they're just wondering oh. how did that come about? Well, no, I mean, uh, do you know something? I can't remember who was in One Man and His Dog. It was in two thousand three, so well, that was like name, the names I've been given are yeah. right. Where are they? Theresa May. Yes. Misty, and that's obviously that's obviously not the MP. <laughs> no, no, not the MP. No, I think, I think this is before she got into politics. <laughs> I know you made things for May. Yeah, yeah. Um, Misty, Misty McCain, and yeah. uh, an obvious porn star named Emma Butt. <laughs> um, so, so to answer your question, what it and this is how it all come about. <clears throat> obviously, when you're doing a film like Foot Soldier. And the script says um, the, the, the woman gets her tits out or her fanny out and people are, are sniffing coke off her tits or, or whatever the scene is. If you're a serious actress and someone brings you up and says, would you like to come on the set for, for, for one scene and just be naked and have people sniffing coke off your tits? There's not a big queue of actresses that want to do that. And that's just being brutally honest. And, um, you Even know, then she's I, not going out to do that role. <laughs> Well, no, they, I, th- I just think, you know, um, a lot of actresses don't want to do nudity. Um, a lot of actresses are, are all about empowering women and are all about um, strong female characters. And I think if you say to them, look, you know, you're in a lad's film and you've got to get your tits out, it's a little bit crass. And I think, um, you know, th- th- you, you, you know, I wouldn't want <clears throat> uh, um, an actress to come onto one of my films and actually, um, you know, think... Oh, uh, you know, I, I'm only, I've, I'm, you know, I, I just think it's, it's just bad taste, you know. And I, and I think um, I've, I've over the years because of the films that we've made, <clears throat> there's, there's a lot of when we do premieres and stuff. There's a lot of models. There's a lot of actresses. There's a lot of reality stars. There's a lot of porn stars that watch their films. Don't ask me why they just do. And over the years, I've, I mean, I met one um, porn star when I was at the Marbella Film Festival. Um, called Ava Cox and um I didn't know who she was and she's quite tall um and she's got this really thick man mancunian accent and she came up to me and she's going all right Terry you know I love your movies and I said to her I said oh, I was said um I said I said um what do you do and she said she said I'm a fucking porn star and I said oh I said uh, I thought you was one of the Cheshire housewives and then she sort of all <laughs> we laughed at and she went, I'm not a fucking Cheshire housewife. I have been a housewife in the film. God, I've not been a Cheshire housewife. But um, it was just very funny. And, um, um, and, and you know, they all, they all say, oh, you know, I'd love to be in a film. It's just like reality stars. You know, it's like, you know, if you talk to anybody who's got any profile, um, you know, would you like to be in a movie? I just think it's, it's something that, you know, if you, yeah, obviously, Acting in a porn film is completely different to acting in a, in a, in a proper film, but um, I think that you know they're quite up for a laugh, <clears throat> and for them, they see it as you know this is I'm getting paid to do something which is not what I normally do, um, 
but then as i said it's it's it, it just kind of worked and and they've got massive you know what what that ava cox has got something like seven hundred and fifty thousand followers on instagram they've all got you know one hundred and fifty thousand followers so <clears throat> obviously that they're, they're, they're their main sort of fans are mainly men so you know with lads and um you know they'll watch their films so putting them in the film and getting them you know like emma buck when she uh, uh, appeared in, in the last foot soldier <clears throat> we just said you know do you want to just do you, do you not want to get naked in this one do you just want to be you know like a a hen a stag do and and she said oh i get to keep my clothes in and we was like yeah but then she went out and she actually got herself her outfit and she was you know completely into it and uh I think, you know, she, I don't know, they just really give it 100% and they, they love being in the film and they love coming to the premiere and they love telling all their friends and their fans, you know, yeah. that they're in, in, in a foot soldier film. And obviously, if, if I made a film that was, um, you know, a, a serious film or a film that was, you know, that, that, that was, you know, maybe, you know, 15 or, you know, family movie, obviously I wouldn't be casting porn stars in those roles. But um, I think, you know, we, in the foot soldier world, We've had sort of boxers, porn stars, uh, real life criminals, um, people that were from that era. Yeah. You know, Carl, Carlton made the cameo in the first one. Bernard Mahoney made a cameo in the in the in the most recent one. Um, and you know, I think it's all just taken in jest. You know, it's not we're not it's, we're not taking ourselves too seriously. But um, you know, that's why you know they they appeared in the movie just purely because you know, they were struggling when they were sort of sending the script out. And, you know, if you're an actress and you, you know, you, you want to build up your, um, uh, your CV, you know, being in a film where you're, you're getting your tits out or, you know, someone sniffing coke off your bum or something, it's not something you're going to probably want to put on your show, room, you know. So um, I think that, that that's the other reason why. And, and also, you know, you, when you approach the agent, the agents don't even pass it on. They just say, my client's not going to do that. So um, I just think, you know, and, and we can't not have that in the film because, you know, the foot soldier thing, the whole point of it is it's 18, it's violent, you know, it's it's just crazy, you know, and uh, and, it, and it pushes the boundaries. And that's what makes the, the film so good. If, if they were done in a sort of politically correct manner where all the girls, you know, kept their clothes on and the guys didn't say cunt every two minutes. I mean, a friend of mine the other day, Said he said, Oh, we we had a really fun game over Christmas. <clears throat> and I said, What's that? And he said, Well, every time anybody says the C word in the film, we have a shot. And I said, Did you get through the whole film? He said, No, we can only get not into the first 10 minutes. <laughs> but um, but you know, it's funny. I mean, the, the foot soldier's been a, you know, it's been a phenomenon. I mean, you know, it's 19, it, well, no, when was it? 2000 and 2007. 2006 was when it was made. Oh, it was released in 2007. Yeah. So you know you know the, the series of films this is the 15th year of foot soldier I and mean, it's insane well this sort of leads on to the, the the other question the popular question that was asked um was that uh, you know after the origins from last year which i i really enjoyed it's it, it seems yeah. a really good business um are we uh, what's the, the future for a foot soldier six don't know um you know i spoke to the guys and they all said to me um oh you know we are going to do another one um, but we might do a reboot, we might do this, we might do that. And I, I don't think they've made any firm decisions, but I think the, the, the big issue with the franchise is because if you speak to anybody, you know, they like it because of the three guys. So I think if the three guys aren't in it, um, it might not be something that people want to watch. And I think, and I think you, you know, the people are going to, you know, it's a little bit like Carlito's Way. When you watch Carlito's Way, it's one of the best gangster films ever made. And then when you watch Coletta's Way 2, it's got nobody in it from the first one. So you go, well, where's Al Pacino? Where's all these other, you know, and it, you just, you know, it's just no good. And, uh, you know, so I think it's, it's, it's unfortunately a big gamble. Um, but, you know, if they pull it off and they do manage to reboot it with some new characters and it's what happened after they died, you know, I think people will still be interested in that. But I just don't know whether the Foot Soldier fans, because for the last 15 years, they're used to watching that film with those three people in it. Yeah. Um, and, you know, everyone's got a favourite character. Some people like Craig Ralph, some people like me, some people like Pat Tate, you know, so which, yeah. whoever it is, and, but most of them like the, the chemistry between the, the three people, you know, so 